Our scripture reading this morning is from Matthew chapter 5, 21 through 26, New King's, King James Version. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Rekha, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Agree with your adversary quickly while you were on your way with him, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge. The judge hand you over to the officer, and you will be thrown into prison. Assuredly, I say to you, you will by no means get out of there till you have paid the debt in full. There is an old preacher story of a young preacher that moved to his first work and as he began preaching the first Sunday he thought he'd really dive in and preach some things that he felt like the people needed to hear so the very first Sunday he preached on gambling and one brother after the sermon was over pulled him aside and said, uh, young man you, you can't preach on gambling, a third of our congregation works over here at the local casino and so he thought about that and he came back the next week and he said that he thought he would preach on drinking and so he preached a very scriptural lesson on the problems of drinking and same brother pulled him over aside after the lesson and he said young man you can't preach on drinking a, a third of our membership works over here at the local distillery so he gave it some thought and he said, uh, the next week, I, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to preach on tobacco, the problems of uh, cigarettes and smoking and, and all of that. And he got up and he tried to support his lesson in every way with Scripture. And the same brother pulled him aside and said, young man, you cannot preach on smoking and tobacco. Don't you understand that a third of our members are farmers and they raise tobacco? And the young man looked at him and he said, well, then what can I preach on? And the, and the gentleman looked at him and said, well, you could preach on elephants. We don't have one of them for a thousand miles. Well, I want you to think about that and how that pertains to this lesson. How many of you, and I'm going to ask this question rhetorically, that means don't raise your hand, <laughs> but how many of you have committed murder? Then why would this lesson pertain to me? Uh, how many of my brothers or sisters in Christ am I currently engaged in a lawsuit? Well, once again, somebody might say, then what's the application for us? Let me say to everyone right now that if you look at Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 through 26, as only a passage of Scripture on thou shalt not murder and thou shalt not sue your brother, then I think you're missing the message that Jesus intended. This morning we're going to take a look at a lesson that is a lot more than just murder and lawsuits. We're going to take a look this morning at the principle of prevention. Because this is what I think that Jesus is trying to get across to us in this passage that Rick read for us just a moment ago. So let's take a look at the first of two points that we're going to examine this morning. Let's take a look at what Jesus starts off in this particular passage by preventing the problem. If you take a look at those first two verses of Scripture, verses 21 and 22, Jesus starts off by saying to them, you have heard. And you've heard a couple of things. You've heard this concept, you shall not commit murder. Well, that's true. That came right out of the Old Testament, Exodus chapter 20 and verse 13 reads, you shall not murder. If you have the King James Version, it says you shall not kill. But the idea here was 
because of a decision you made with premeditation in your heart to take a life that's not yours to take, one of the Ten Commandments stated, Thou shalt not kill. You shall not murder. This was something that was reiterated throughout the Law of Moses. And it was emphasized for us in passages of Scripture like Leviticus chapter 24 and verse 21 where we read that the one who kills a man or murders a man shall be put to death. So not only was it a serious crime, it was a capital offense. And so if you were to murder someone, you yourself, your life would be required of you. But Jesus also says, you have heard that whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. Now, if you were to take a look at Deuteronomy chapter 16 and verse 18, you would see an instruction under the law of Moses that was given to the people concerning the organization of their government, concerning the organization of the judiciary, the court system. And so we read, you shall appoint for yourselves judges and officers in all your towns which the Lord your God is giving you according to your tribes and they shall judge the people with righteous judgment. If you commit murder, that was wrong and it would require of you your life. But how that sentence was to be carried out was left in the hands of the people. They were to establish a court system and perhaps this is something that we might consider today to be the lower court system that would take place from town to town. Usually a, a group of some seven men typically would uh, sit on this court and they would make the judgments as to when and how this sentence would be carried out. And so Jesus is saying, you've heard from the law of Moses, from the mouth of God, that you're not to commit murder. And you've also heard and understand by the commandments and the traditions that are carried forth that if you do so, you're going to be brought before a court of law to answer for your crime. Jesus says in the very next breath, though, he says, But I say to you, that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. Now remember that very same lower court system that we just talked about was where you would go if you committed murder. Jesus comes along and he says, your unrighteous anger is just as bad in the eyes of God as murder. David would write in Psalm 37 and verse 8, Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret, for it leads only to evil doing. What we're reading here in the book of Psalms is this idea that Jesus is trying to get across in the book of Matthew. And that is that we usually don't just wake up one day and decide to commit murder arbitrarily. It is usually because of something that has happened long ago that has stayed with us, that we did not resolve, that we did not get rid of. And because it stayed with us, it started to infest and infect our thinking and our lives. And it grew and it grew and it grew to the point that we wrongfully take a life. Jesus says, yes, that's wrong, but don't you understand that when you get angry for selfish reasons, when you get angry for prideful reasons, do you not understand that that is just as wrong as the end result? Because that is what leads to the end result. If we get rid of this, if we prevent the problem before it ever takes place, then we'll never get here. We also read in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 26 and 27, the opposite of unrighteous anger. We talk about righteous anger because Paul says by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, be angry and yet do not sin. The idea is there are reasons for which we might get angry, reasons for which we might justifiably get angry. I am angry that I live in a country that has allowed for the last several decades millions upon millions of innocent children to be killed, to be murdered. That angers me. But at the same time, I also have to make sure that I check that anger at the door. 
that I don't allow it to consume me because although that may be righteous anger because I'm angry about the very same thing that God is angry about, I cannot allow that righteous anger to turn into something that is evil, to allow it to get a hold of me in an improper way. If you'll notice in that very same passage of Scripture where it says, Be angry and yet do not sin, it says, Do not let the sun go down on your anger and do not give the devil an opportunity. We've got to make sure that we keep that anger in its proper place and not allow it to go somewhere where we are opening up our lives for the devil to get a foothold. Because once he gets a foothold, now we're starting to journey down this path of destruction. In the same chapter, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 31 and 32, Paul said, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. In our teenage class this morning, we were talking about one of the examples one of the ways that young people are to overcome the problem that they always face, and that is that the older sometimes look down at the younger simply because they are young. Paul would say to Timothy, he says, one of the ways that you overcome this is to be sound in speech. And that's what we talked about this morning. So I talked about just some of the things that we say, some of the things that we comment on. How many times are we negative with what we say? How many times are we destructive with what we say? How many times are we very simply not productive with what we say? How many of us truly think about what we're going to say before we say it? How many times do we then turn around and we try to be encouraging with our words? We talk about those people who are productive with their speech, those people who build up people's lives and lift them up with the words that they use that are seasoned with grace. That's the kind of people we have to be. And if we allow anger, unrighteous, selfish, sinful anger to take hold of our heart, I promise you that what is on the inside will come out to the outside. And it will be evident by the words of our lips and ultimately by the actions that we take. Going back to Matthew chapter 5, Jesus then says, whoever says to his brother, if you have the King James Version, it says the word raka. Other translations say things like, you good for nothing. But whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. Now, if you have the King James Version, that word raka is a Syriac word. It was a, a word that was used to insult someone. Uh, it was a word that was described, uh, used to describe someone that they would consider an empty-headed person, an idiot, a stupid individual. So what Jesus is saying here, whoever says to his brother, you stupid person, you ignorant person, you good for nothing. And I'm not talking about someone who does not have a certain amount of information. I'm not talking about somebody who is not productive in the work they're doing. I'm not talking about how those terms might be used legitimately. We're talking about names that are called because of anger. And you know what I'm talking about. You've seen people get angry and they just fly off the cuff and they start spouting things off. They just start saying things. And here we're seeing someone who is diminishing someone else. They are putting them down because of the frustration and the wrath that is starting to consume their thinking. Jesus says, whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. Some of your translations will say counsel. And this was a reference to the Sanhedrin, which was that ultimate Jewish court. But once again, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 29 reads, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment so that it will give grace to those who hear. Think about that. I asked the question this morning in my class and I used one of our students who's a little quieter as the example and the other person I used as the example was me. 
And I said, when it comes to our talking, what's the difference between this individual and me? And of course, my own daughter piped up and says, because you talk all the time. Well, that's right. I, I do kind of. My personality type is one that when you ask me a question, I am often thinking while I'm speaking. You know what that means? It means I get in trouble a lot because it's a whole lot better to think before you speak. And so what I challenged the young people this morning is what I challenged myself. This next week, this next seven days, we're going to really try to think about what we're saying. We're going to really try to think before we say it. We're going to try to not say anything negative that is unproductive. We're going to try to not talk about things that are destructive. We're going to try to have good, positive, productive, uplifting, and encouraging speech because we're going to try to get rid of the attitudes that lead to destruction. We're going to try to embrace the attitudes that build up the body of Christ. Jesus then says, whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. Over the years, we have unfortunately taken this particular passage of Scripture and we've created something that's not intended there. We have created the magic bad word. And so some of you remember growing up and, and you might have heard somebody called an idiot. You might have heard somebody called stupid. But if somebody said, you fool, people went... <gasps> In other words, it was okay to call them these other names, but just don't say the magic bad word. Well, the word fool here, and the word fool in general, is not always a bad term. The word fool, first of all, from a biblical standpoint, means someone who is contrary to God. For instance, uh, in Psalm 14 and verse 1, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. So someone who is foolish is someone who has not recognized God, has not accepted God, has not obeyed God. And it is certainly proper to describe a sinner's actions as foolish. But what we're talking about here is that ultimate name that I can use in the heat of the moment to really get you, to really put you down by basically calling you a name that was associated amongst the children of Israel with those who would embrace idolatry those people who would worship false gods. I'm not just saying you're ignorant. I'm not just saying you're stupid. I'm saying you are a rebellious person to God. You are a disobedient person. You are not serving God anymore. You are a sinner and you're going to the place that is lost. All of this said not out of proper context, but out of the anger of my heart. Jesus says the person who goes through that, the person who manifests this attitude and utilizes this kind of language, he said she'll be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. Now the word hell here in the original text is the word that is a combination of terms but is a word that is used Gehenna. And the word Gehenna comes from a a valley that was outside of Jerusalem that at one point in time in the Old Testament was a beautiful place. But during a time where idolatry emerged among the people of that time, some of the people would fall into the idol worship of the false god Moloch. And Moloch was, as at least as he was manifested as a statue, he was a human being with a calf head. And his arms were outstretched as to welcome anyone. And what the people would do is during this time of great idol worship, they would actually heat a fire at the base of this statue, this bronze brass statue that would heat up so hot that the arms would almost be glowing with the heat. And they would then take their children and place their children in the arms of the statue. Not only would the the fire kill the child, but the very sheer heat that was present at the statue, on the statue, coming in contact with the statue, would kill the child. But while the child was screaming, while the child was in agony, 
they would play loud instruments to cover up the shrieks and the cries so that they could continue to justify their actions in their own minds as good. Later on in the Old Testament, because of the evil that had taken place in this place, eventually this valley of Hinnom, this Gehenna, as it would be understood by the people of Jesus' day, became a place of refuse, a place of garbage, even the place of the dumping of dead bodies. And the stench and the odor was so terrible that they would have to light fires just to take care of the stench. But at the same time, because it was trash and because there was so much of it, those fires would burn night and day. When Jesus uses this expression... And he says, by calling someone a fool or by suggesting that they are eternally lost, he says, you take your own salvation into consideration. You are threatening or you are being threatened with the idea that you will be cast into a place that is like this valley, this place that is terrible, this place where you don't want to see, you don't want to go, you don't want to experience. And this is a place that is eternally prepared for you in mark chapter 9 verses 43 through 48 mark chapter 9 verses 43 through 48 jesus says if your hand causes you to stumble cut it off it is better for you to enter life crippled than having your two hands to go into hell into the unquenchable fire where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched Verse 45 reads, if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than having your two feet to be cast into hell where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Verse 47, if your eye causes you to stumble, throw it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. What this is saying over and over again is, there is nothing that you want to do in this life to be cast into this place. Because when it says where their worm does not die, that means where you do not die, where your life will never end. And your life will never end in a place where the fire is never quenched. We often hear that terminology in the Bible in a lake that burns with fire and brimstone, the second death. Well, this is a death where you will not just come to the end of your existence this is a conscious eternal torment that we do not want to be a part of john would write in first john chapter 3 verses 10 through 12 by this the children of god and the children of the devil are obvious anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of god nor the one who does not love his brother. For this is the message which you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain. Now, who was Cain? He was the original murderer. So John says, not as Cain, who was the evil one and slew his brother. And for what reason did he slay him? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. You know, quite literally, from the information that we can glean from Scripture, we go back to Cain and we realize that prior to this particular offering, we know of no real major problem between Cain and Abel. But because Abel's offer, offering, his sacrifice was pleasing to God, and because Cain's was not pleasing to God, Cain developed an attitude. And whereas he might have directed that attitude toward God, who was displeased in the first place, we see that he directs the attitude toward his brother because he ultimately kills his brother. And you remember the story, when God comes to him, he says, where's your brother Abel? And that attitude continues to be manifested. Am I my brother's keeper? Even after Abel is dead, even after the murder has been accomplished, Cain is still angry. That's not the sign of a child of God. That's not the hallmark of a disciple of Christ. A disciple of Christ is someone who loves. John would write in 1 John 3, 15, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. I want you to think about that. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And that was the message Jesus was trying to get across. He was not saying, 
do everything just shy of murdering. He was not saying that's the big sin. He's saying it's all sin. The entire process is sin. From the moment that you have an ill thought, a, a, a wrongful attitude, at the moment that that selfish anger takes seed in your life, you are on a path to destruction. Stop it. Prevent the problem from ever occurring. Be loving. Be kind. Be long-suffering. But don't give in to anger. Well, we talked about preventing the problem. <laughs> but what if this message is delivered to you while you're right in the middle of that problem? The prevention uh, is a little late because you now find yourself in the middle of a problem. Well, that's exactly what Jesus addresses in Matthew 5, verses 23 through 26. It's in verses 23 and 24 in particular that he says, Therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and present your offering. Now, I'm fond of making this next point, but... It's a point worthy to be made because if we understand God and how God works with us, how God expects us to live, God never expects us to rely on somebody else to do what we can. So for instance, in that passage of Scripture we read, if you're presenting your offering at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, if he has something against you, you've either done something wrong or he thinks you've done something wrong then guess who gets to go resolve it? I do. But it's very interesting. In Mark chapter 11 and verse 25, we read this passage of Scripture. Whoever you, whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone so that your Father who is in heaven will also forgive you your trespasses. Here's a situation where I have something against somebody else. Maybe they've done wrong or I perceive that they have done me wrong. Who gets to solve the problem? I do. God never allows me to put that responsibility onto somebody else. I have that responsibility to right a wrong that's in my life, whether I have committed that wrong against you or you've committed that wrong against me. I'm to put my best foot forward. I'm to take the first step. I'm to initiate the reconciliation. If you have that same attitude, now we've got two people working toward the same goal. And problems get resolved even in the midst of those problems. But let's go back to what Jesus said in Matthew 5. Here's a situation where you're giving your offering, and this is something that the Jews would have done in the Old Testament, of course, in the uh, tabernacle, in the New Testament, in the temple. And, and of course, we see them giving this offering when they give this offering, he says, if you're in the process of doing this and you remember your brother has something against you, then you go and you fix the problem. You go and try to find reconciliation, try to find peace, try to find a resolution to that problem in progress. Don't let it grow. Don't let it fester. Don't let it become something bigger than it is. Kill it while you can found a very interesting statement. Albert Barnes wrote the following, and I realize you may not be able to read all of that on the overhead, but I want you to listen to what Albert Barnes says in his commentary. He says, first be reconciled means to settle the difficulty, to make proper acknowledgement or satisfaction for the injury. If you have wronged him, make restitution. If you owe him a debt which ought to be paid, pay it. If you have injured, the, injured his character, confess it and seek pardon. If he is under an erroneous impression, if your conduct has been such as to lead him to suspect that you have injured him, make an explanation. Do all in your power and all you ought to do to have the matter settled, to end it. And that's exactly right. And that's why Jesus says in verses 25 and 26, make friends quickly with your opponent at law while you are with him on the way so that your opponent may not hand you over to the judge and the judge to the officer and you be thrown into prison. 
He says, truly I say to you, you will not come out of there until you have paid up the last cent. A physical court of law is a serious thing. And we've been talking about this on Wednesday nights as we've been studying 1 Corinthians chapter 6. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, as Paul is writing to the church at Corinth, he says to these brethren in verse 1, Does any one of you, when he has a case against his neighbor, dare to go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? In other words, as we've been studying, if I have a brother or sister in Christ and our mutual goal is to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, then we will love each other as ourselves and we'll resolve this problem before it ever gets to a court of law, before it's ever exposed in public, before it ever brings shame on our reputation and the reputation of the church. We'll solve it. And so Jesus says, go, make friends. Don't do what some in Corinth were doing. In 1 Corinthians 6, verses 6 and 7, Paul says, brother goes to law with brother, and that before unbelievers. Actually, then it's already a defeat for you that you have lawsuits with one another. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be defrauded? Paul is saying it would, better, it would be better for you to take personal injury, for you to be harmed in some way, than to drag the name of Christ through the public mud. So can you resolve the problem? Can you first be reconciled even if you're on your way to court with this person who stands against you? Whether it's my fault or his fault, can we work this out? Can we resolve this? Can I personally sacrifice and give up what is necessary in order to make things right so that my brother can be lifted up, so that the body of Christ can be a bright and shining light set on a hill so that God can ultimately be glorified. In Romans chapter 12, verses 17 through 21, Paul says, Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. You know what I thought about when I thought about this passage of Scripture? Not only the passage from Matthew that we're studying, but this passage of Scripture from Romans. The idea here is that we need to try to be at peace with everyone. It will not always be possible. It's never going to be possible to be completely at peace with the world because the master we serve is different from the master they serve. Sometimes it's even difficult within the body of Christ because sometimes brothers and sisters think more of themselves than they think of God. They consider their own selfish desires of greater import than the will of the Father. But as far as Kevin Patterson is concerned, as far as you are concerned this morning, will you do all that you can according to the will of God and according to the strength that He gives you to be at peace with God and with your fellow man. Can we do that? Because as I think about this idea of preventing problems, there are so many people who are not preventing problems, they're in the middle of a problem. They're in the middle of a problem called sin and they don't realize that God has already provided a way of escape. They've already provided a way of escape from that place that burns with fire and brimstone from that eternal Gehenna. He has provided a way of escape through the death of His Son. And this morning, if you're not a child of God, if you will believe on Jesus Christ as the Son of God who gave Himself for us and paid the price for our sins on the cruel cross of Calvary, if you will repent of your sins and make a change, if you'll confess the name of Christ, and be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of sins. Do you realize what you're doing? You are preventing a problem from happening. Because the problem is that you could continue in sin and face that ultimate destruction 
that eternal destruction that we will face away from the presence of God if we do not submit to Him. Prevent the problem. If it's a problem in progress, prevent the problem. Stop the problem. Reconcile the problem. But make sure whether you are outside of God or in Christ today, make sure that you are right with Him. Make sure you are at peace with the Father. And then you might look around and see a brother or sister that maybe you're not as strong as you ought to be with. Maybe you're not as close. Maybe something was said, something was done, and it's stuck in your mind. If it's not something that you can resolve internally, go to that brother or sister. Resolve that problem. Allow that anger, that wrath, that malice that could build and turn into something God never intended. Get rid of it now so that you can be at peace with your brother or sister in Christ. And ultimately set the best example that you can for the world around you, if possible. So far as it is up to you, be at peace with all men, Paul says. In other words, be at peace regarding what you can control. And this morning, God has given us control over a lot. He's given us the responsibility over a lot. All it requires of us is that we humble ourselves that we love Him and long for what He wants more than what we want. What it requires of us is the desire for love and peace in all aspects of our life and then following through with what it takes to accomplish it. Lesson's not all about murder. It's not all about taking your brother or your sister to court. It is about preventing problems. And this morning, let's make that commitment. To starting right here, right now, that we're going to prevent future problems. And if you find that you're in one of those situations where you're already in the midst of that problem, then make the commitment right now to do what you can right away to resolve it. While together we stand and sing.